Hello, everyone from the St. John's campus of Memorial University of Newfoundland and Labrador. My name is Janet Heron. I'm an alumni engagement officer at Memorial and your host for today's event. In celebration of Nurse Practitioner Week, we are thrilled to have Dr. Jill Bruno as our special guest today. She will be explaining the powerful and growing role these professionals play in the healthcare system. I know those of you attending can't see who else is in the room for the event, but we have over 100 re registrants today, which we are thrilled about, and we have more joining every moment, which is great, and we are delighted that you have chosen to spend some time with us today. We will begin today's event with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the lands on which Memorial University's campuses are situated are in the traditional territories of diverse Indigenous groups, and we acknowledge with respect the histories and cultures of the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of this province. We encourage everyone to reflect on these lands from where you are located and the Indigenous peoples for whom these lands are traditional territory. At the Office of Alumni Engagement, we are focused on offering many ways for you to connect with Memorial from anywhere in the world, anywhere in the province, the country, and the world. We, and we're working diligently to foster opportunities for alumni and friends to celebrate their connections with Memorial and with each other. MUN Alum 101 was born out of the need to reach out to, to alumni during the first few months of the pandemic. It has since evolved to become a cornerstone of our alumni engagement activities, offering the latest information on key topics from Memorial University's own experts. Embarking on new and exciting ways to build relationships within our Memorial community is vital to, to our evolution as an institution. Now, just a few housekeeping issues. A brief Q&A will follow Dr. Bruno's presentation. I will be monitoring the Q&A and the chat functions, which you will find at the bottom right hand side of your screen. Please try to keep your questions short and uh, I encourage you to post questions as soon as possible. Please don't leave them to the last minute as we have a very full program and will only have a limited time to take questions. Attendees cannot unmute your microphones or turn on your videos, but you can communicate with other attendees through the chat. And you can also enable closed captioning at the bottom left hand side of your screen. You also have the option to customize your view of this presentation if you click on the dots on the right hand on the top right of your screen. We are streaming live, but this session is also being recorded and all those who registered will receive a link in a follow up email, including a PDF of Dr. Bruno's presentation. It is my great pleasure to officially introduce our special guest today. Dr. Jill Bruno is the nurse practitioner coordinator for the Master of Science in Nursing program and an assistant professor at Memorial School of Nursing. She is a nurse practitioner, has a Master's of Health Science from the University of Toronto and a PhD from Memorial. A nurse practitioner, pr practitioner with extensive experience caring for cardiac patients, Dr. Bruno's dissertation work focused on cardiovascular health promotion. She has received numerous scholarships and research grants for both her dissertation work and current research initiatives. And she is working in the areas of knowledge translation, management of risk factors, and timely access of vulnerable groups to appropriate healthcare services. Now, I will now give Dr. Bruno uh, the controls. I'm just going to pull up her presentation here and I'm going to mute myself and stop my video and give her the controls and take it away. Thank you, Janet, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about nurse practitioners and the future of healthcare in our province. It's great to have this opportunity uh, to share my perspective on the topic as a nurse practitioner and as an educator of nurse practitioners at Memorial University. Of course, it is important to get the perspective of healthcare providers on the future of healthcare, but is likely to result in views of just one profession. 
What we really need to think about as health providers and as people who receive care from health providers is how we can do things better. We need to get away from our siloed perspectives and think more broadly and collectively about how we can improve access to care and to deliver more coordinated care in the future. So I'm excited uh, to share an overview of nurse practitioners in Newfoundland and Labrador, including the educational preparation, the scope of practice, uh, to share with you where MPs work uh, in our province today. So, of course, we do have uh, issues in our current healthcare system, many issues, as you're well aware of, and there are also opportunities for change. And I'd like to discuss how MPs can contribute to addressing some of these problems. Finally, I'd like to highlight some strategies or solutions based on lessons learned from the pandemic, uh, as well as the, some of the work done by the Health Accord, and how nurse practitioners and many others can help to shape our, our healthcare system in the future and improve the health of our population. So what is a nurse practitioner? Um, so to become a nurse practitioner today, uh, graduate education is required across Canada and the US and of course in our province. And many uh, MPs have gone further to obtain a doctorate of nursing practice or a PhD. MPs are completely independent health providers and they provide a wealth of knowledge and deliver high quality of care in uh, many different settings. And I'm gonna share some of those, some examples of those settings with you today. And MPs provide timely and geographic access to people in urban, rural, and very remote areas of our province. So just a little history um, about nurse practitioner education. Um, so in terms of educational preparation, prior to 2013, uh, in the late 1990s, education to become a nurse practitioner in Newfoundland and Labrador was at the diploma level, and it was offered at the Center for Nursing Studies. Uh, a transition program offered between 2009 and 2013 was offered at Memorial in collaboration with faculty at the Center for Nursing Studies, and nurses graduated with uh, their Bachelor of Nursing uh, along with the, the MP content uh, in the curriculum. And since 2013, to become an MP, uh, graduate education is required, and this is a standard across Canada. So at Memorial uh, Faculty of Nursing, uh, you can earn a Master of Science in Nursing degree with an MP option. We also offer a post-master's uh, MP diploma for nurses that already have their Master of Nursing, but want to come back to complete uh, the six specific uh, NP specific courses. So you can see this is just a list of the 12 courses that are required in the program. And for someone coming to do the diploma would have to do uh, the courses on the right hand side. I know you can't read that. Sorry about that. <laughs> but just to clear, just to simplify things, uh, this table shows a program of study for a full time student uh, who would complete the program in eight semesters uh, or two and a half years. And this, of course, is on top of their, they're already registered nurses, remember. Um, and so for part time, they would do the program in 11 semesters or over three and a half years. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about the in the MP program uh, at in the Master of Science, uh, I encourage you to uh, contact us at gradnursing at mon.ca try to recruit a few people while, while, while I'm here today. Okay, so currently, um, as of November 10th, uh, this is some information from the College of Registered Nurses of Newfoundland and Labrador. There's 251 registered nurse practitioners in our province. Uh, the majority of MPs are working at the master's prepared level, the, around 70%. And there's also about 20% with their Bachelor of Nursing and Nurse Practitioner designation and 10% uh, with the, that are diploma prepared. And there are also a few people, sorry, a few MPs that have a PhD or doctorate of nursing practice in, in Newfoundland and Labrador. Okay, so the scope of practice of nurse practitioners is determined by the College of N Registered Nurses of Newfoundland and Labrador. And this is the regulatory body for registered nurses and nurse practitioners who are mandated to protect the public 
through self-regulation of the profession and to ensure that MP practice that MPs practice according to the Registered Nurses Act. MPs have specific roles and responsibility and the college ensures that MPs have the necessary education that I've just talked about, um, the authorization in terms of policies with legislation and regulations, as, as well as uh, according to policies in health organizations. They also need to have the competence according to national entry level competencies and additional competencies may be acquired by MPs uh, in the in their employment setting. According to the ARNL, they say that nurse practitioners must have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to perform skills, actions, and competently care for the patients that they are, are responsible for. The scope of practice is also determined according to policies set forth by the employer. So you can see the regional health authorities there. Um, so the scope of practice is dependent, obviously, on the needs of the patient population in that setting where the MP is working. So this may look a little bit different depending on where the MP is employed and the care needs of the population. And I'll provide a few examples of where MPs work in the slides ahead. So as the needs of the population changes um, over time and the health system changes, the scope and the scope of practice, of course, has to follow suit. And then there's changes uh, in the le legislation, regulation, policies, and of course, then the education to prepare MPs to practice. Okay, so where do MPs currently work in the province? Uh, MPs work across Newfoundland and Labrador and all regional health authorities. They work in hospitals, long-term care, mental health and addictions, recovery centers. They also work in private industry and collaborative team clinics. So we have from St. John's to Bonavista to Central, Port of Basque, and up the Northern Peninsula, Bombay, up the Northern Peninsula, right up to St. Anthony, and then into Labrador, Lab City, Goose Bay, and as far north as Natrashish on the coast of Labrador. Just want to give you an idea of where we are. <laughs> so where do we work? So some of the places of work, the majority of MPs are actually employed in the hospital setting, about 87. You can't really see that, uh, you may not be able to see that, but that's about 87. And then also MPs work in the community health centers and that's about 55 MPs. So that comprises about 55% uh, of where MPs are employed. The remaining MPs work in areas such as family practice, uh, government, long-term care, nursing stations up north, and, or some uh, MPs work regionally across multiple sites. They also work in businesses like offshore. Um, they may work in education um, or they may be self-employed. So I just want to give you a snapshot of that. Okay, so now I'm going to give you, uh, I want to share some examples of where MPs work. As promised, uh, so MPs work in the hospital in both inpatient and outpatient areas. There are MPs in the emergency room, internal medicine, medical and surgical units, for example, internal medicine, cardiology, cardiac surgery, the stroke unit, urology, and so on, oncology. And in uh, and MPs are an integral mem uh, member in the interprofessional team uh, in the hospital setting. They're often the constant provider as staff positions rotate or residents begin their and end their rotations. MPs are the constant providers. Um, so, for example, if someone was coming in for heart surgery, I know that area quite well. Uh, they may, the MP would do the history and physical, meet the patient and their family, and then follow them through their trajectory through the through their uh, hospital journey and uh, have their surgery and then post-op would be involved in their care until they were either discharged home or transferred to another facility. So you had the constant, you know, MP uh, there. They also work in outpatient clinics, for example, the heart failure or heart function clinic, um, and they currently manage about, uh, the MPs there currently manage about 400 patients, outpatients. Okay, another example, collaborative team clinics that I mentioned earlier. So over the past couple of years, these collaborative team clinics began offering access to needed care in St. John's metro area. And there's also these clinics that are um, 
that are also um, evolving over the across the province in central, and then there is definitely a, a one over on the on the west coast as well. So these clinics, uh, you know, have been um, around for a long, long time. Not in not in our province, but uh, you know, when I was doing my masters in Toronto, they were there, and that was a long time ago, <laughs> twenty five years ago. Uh, they were community health centers were very common with the full suite of of, um, of um, health providers, as you can see here. Um, uh, so it's not a new concept, but uh, we finally caught on to that here in our province, and I think that they're doing quite well in relation to the number of uh, providers that they have, and um, and what services they're able to offer. So. Um, so, for example, I just want to provide over there on the right, it says some services that the MP focus on are chronic disease management, you know, diabetes management. So, you know, adjusting insulins and, you know, and that's in, co in coordination with the diabetic uh, or the certified di diabetes, sorry, diabetes educators. Um, they also do uh, hypertension management, you know, managing the monitoring blood pressure and adding or, or taking away different uh, antihypertensive medications, uh, as well as obesity management. That's just a few examples. Um, and then they also are involved in mental health and addictions um, in terms of vaccinations and prevention, preventative care, and they also do home visits. And that was particularly uh, prevalent in the time of the pandemic and also had provided palliative care for some people at that time. Um, another example is the harm reduction clinic. And you can see on the left, there's a number of providers there that um, that work in this clinic, and and this is a very patient centered um, clinic. I, I guess we we all we always talk about being patient centered as nurse practitioners, but in this particular clinic, they build the services around the patients. They meet the patients where they are and encourage people to set their own priorities. Um, they prioritize safety, individual. Uh, decision making, and they really uh, talk about and, and live up to. Uh, respecting the individual over stigma or discriminating them. They focus on sexual health, pregnancy testings, uh, treatment of sexually transmitted diseases, provide condoms, and so on. And they also take this advantage, this opportunity to provide vaccinations because this this uh, particular population are generally underserved and uh, and often would not be able to um, access or are not interested in accessing, uh, you know, uh, some of the other clinics. So this is a very open and uh, a great place for um, for for people who are underserved. Um, So virtual care, so of course, since the pandemic, virtual care has certainly seen a rise uh, and practitioners receive calls to renew prescriptions, review blood work and routine care based on history. Um, not all visits, of course, are appropriate for virtual care and most of the visits uh, are uh, over the telephone. So uh, patients are triaged by the nurse practitioner to determine which patients actually need uh, to come into the clinic or to, um, or to the emergency emergency department, uh, or whether their their needs can be taken care of over the um, over a virtual call. We do have a provincial eight one one line that can put you in contact with an MP, um, and they are actually paid by a private company called PhoneMed. Um, they all that and that program I think is expanding rapidly. Um, MPs also provide. Um, care, virtual care uh, in our province, but also in other jurisdictions across Canada. And there are guidelines in from the Canadian Nurses Protective Society in relation to providing virtual care. And there are also um, guidelines from our own College of Registered Nurses of Newfoundland and Labrador uh, in terms of uh, providing safe, competent care virtually. Okay, another example uh, is uh, MPs are in rural and remote areas, as I mentioned. They may be regional nurses so that they would liaison with community health nurses and dietitians, social workers, and so on across uh, many rural areas uh, across and fulfill the need of uh, caring for people across the region. 
They sometimes, MPs may sometimes work out of hospitals or outpatient uh, clinics in the smaller community hospitals and long-term care facilities as well. Uh, of course, the outpost nursing stations have been in Newfoundland, Labrador and uh, provided by nurses, registered nurses and uh, expanded nurse nurses, as well as um, nurse practitioners in those uh, remote areas. And that's been going on for decades. <laughs> um, they provide, you know, advanced skills and use the telehealth as needed. MPs also work uh, with Indigenous and First Nations communities to provide primary health care uh, to residents, health promotion, uh, and an example of that would be uh, Con River. Okay, so, so I just provided some examples of where MPs work and some services available. Now I want to highlight the roles and responsibilities of nurse practitioners and how they can enhance access to care for people in our province. So as mentioned previously, MPs provide health care to individuals, families, and are responsible for their own practice. MPs assess, diagnose, treat common medical issues and health conditions of, of people that are coming to clinic. So, say, so for example, they treat respiratory uh, illnesses, uh, and they treat according to uh, the best practice guidelines, um, Canadian guidelines um, that uh, other providers use. Um, they can manage care in hospital settings, as I mentioned, uh, with specific roles and responsibility. So MPs provide continuity of care as they care for individuals and families um, throughout their hospital stays, as well as in long-term care and in the community. MPs are excellent communicators and are available to individuals, families, and give the results of diagnostic tests, um, blood work, x-ray, and they can communicate diagnoses of common conditions and follow up on tests. They also refer to other providers such as dietitians, social workers, physicians, and specialist physicians when other providers uh, can, are needed to provide and optimize the care of, of the, the individual. MPs work um, to discharge patients or transfer them to other facilities, and they also provide palliative care and end of life care using um, and are providers um, of medical assistance and dying. So I just wanted to switch gears a little bit. That's what I had to say about nurse practitioners and hopefully I've maybe helped to recruit a few students. I don't know. Um, so we have a lot of issues in our healthcare system. I just wanted to sort of switch gears um, and I think we can all agree on that. Um, I've listed a few of those issues here. Um, so, first of all, I just want to talk about the fact that our healthcare system is focused on a treatment model. And uh, as the majority of the money that is allocated to the province for healthcare is spent on hospitals and on salaries of healthcare providers, diagnostic tests, and special procedures, um, it's not focused, it doesn't have the focus on prevention or health promotion or even uh, on our social system. And that can create problems, as you know. We also have high rates of chronic diseases, as everybody has heard, in terms of heart disease, diabetes, cancer. We have some of the highest rates in the, in the country. And we have an aging population. And this is due to, obviously, the reduced uh, birth rate, out-migration, and uh, the aging baby boomers. In fact, we have the fasting, uh, fastest aging population predicted in Canada for 2024. There's a lack of health healthcare providers available, and we hear this in the news. There's problems with recruitment and retention. Um, people are exhausted from the pandemic. There's a shortage of family doctors. Many health providers are leaving the province. Radiation specialists this past week. We talked about that and having to shut down services and send people up along. Um, they're trying to offer incentives and, and uh, but the government is struggling to, uh, to try to stabilize the healthcare system with the providers that we need. There's also a lack of access to appropriate care. We have overcrowded emergency rooms. There's not enough family doctors. I would say there's not enough primary healthcare providers. 
Uh, the current funding model is a fee for service and MPs uh, cannot bill MCP. So uh, unless, if they're outside of the health authorities, um, so they um, so if somebody wants to see a nurse practitioner, they have to pay out of pocket. Um, and similar to paying for like a physiotherapist visit or a massage therapist visit. So uh, there are barriers there for sure. There's gaps in care for underserved populations and minorities, immigrants, um, and substance abuse, uh, you, you know, drug users, and they have difficulty, as I mentioned, uh, accessing the system. And finally, the other thing, I guess another thing, there's many other issues, but these are some that I just wanted to highlight today. We don't have any money in our province. <laughs> we have very little, so that's a problem. So many issues, but how can MPs contribute to the health needs of the population in our province and address some of these ongoing issues? So based on the focus on a treatment model, MPs are educated regarding the treatment of common conditions, as I mentioned, you know, according to um, current clinical practice guidelines, um, and they manage patient in the hospital and the communities. But we also focus on health promotion, disease prevention, identifying risk factors earlier, uh, and intervening to prevent complications. We have a holistic approach to our care, uh, similar to registered. We are registered nurses, similar to nursing in general. We look at, we focus on the pa patient holistically and not just simply on their disease process. We have high rates of chronic diseases, as I've mentioned. Um, in terms of a fragmented system, we focus on continuity of care. So MPs are available and uh, accountable for helping people to improve their health. They're also the constant provider in the hospital, as I've mentioned. So there's a lack of health care providers. So it would be nice if we could increase the enrollment of nurse practitioner students. Uh, obviously, we need um, we need input there uh, for many different providers, but uh, but uh, the more students that we have, the more people we can uh, educate and be available to our, our people of our province. Um, the funding model, uh, lack of access to care, we talk about, you know, changing the funding model. It needs uh, to change so that we need to think about how we can do that creatively and and um, so that we enable nurse practitioners, family physicians, and other providers to work to their full scope and to be able to, um, uh, you know, be compensated appropriately. Um, we have lack of money, and I just put in there that our MPs are less expensive to employ, but, uh, but uh, you know, we can certainly contribute in that way. And then I did mention about the gaps in underserved populations and MPs are working with vulnerable groups as I've shown you a couple of examples and that really does spread across the province. Um, there's, uh, you know, in terms of, for example, mental health and addictions, we have uh, services across uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. So, and MPs are involved in recovery and um, in, in terms of providing the care for those populations. Okay, so um, fine. So the final summary for the health court uh, was released in June of 2022, and they have a plan for the next 10 years uh, in terms of how we can transform our health system. So the the vision of this health accord was to improve health and health outcomes, uh, acceptance of and interventions in the social determinants of health and provide higher quality uh, health system that balances community, hospital, long-term care, and emergency services. Um, calls to action. Um, I was at a conference last week and I had the uh, an opportunity to listen to Sister Elizabeth uh, talk about this accord, very timely. Uh, she talked about four calls to action and um, focusing on social determinants of health, a rebalanced health system, pathways to facilitate change and governance. So I just want to just talk briefly about these four things, about these calls to action. 
So focusing on the social determinants of health, uh, Sister Elizabeth says 60% of her, your health is determined by the social determinants of health and only 25% by the health system. So we have to look at education, housing, food security, all those socio-economic and environmental factors that influence your health status and determine health. Focus on basic in income strategy that they've talked about, reducing poverty, child health in schools, health in all policies. In terms of a rebalanced health system, um, they talk about the integration of teams in the community, uh, hospitals and long-term care, and then of course the ambulance service. Um, facilitated by patient navigators, uh, community contacts, virtual care, uh, enhancing information systems, and a more focus on, will there be a more focus on health and not disease? I hope putting more money on the prevention side and promoting health, but having enough money in on the treatment side so that we have those people available, the health providers available for emergency and urgent situations. Uh, pathways to facilitate change. So we talked about uh, integrating health and social sectors. And, you know, if you look at the Scandinavian countries, they do, they do a great job with that and their health outcomes are much better than ours. So they're looking at how we can uh, integrate these two systems more effectively. And finally, governance. Uh, so we're, we heard news of our new provincial health authority that will be um, in in 2023, and we look forward to that. Uh, maybe, hopefully, there will be more coordinated care, and uh, we need smart people in charge to help us improve the health system and the health status of our population. So, what did we learn from the pandemic? So. Um, my husband called it a forced experiment. We had to focus on the social determinants of health, on basic needs, food security, housing. These are, by looking at how we responded to the pandemic, it's an opportunity for change that we need to think about. Um, so we had an increase in virtual care, as I've mentioned, use of newer technology uh, in some ways, the access to care was improved through virtual care, but there's many issues uh, with internet access in rural and not so rural areas of the province. We, um, it's amazing, it should be a basic human right to have access to the internet at this point in our, um, in our province and in our history, uh, considering um, what the lack of access uh, can certainly inhibit and uh, certainly affect the, you know, the health uh, by not a, not being able to uh, access providers. Um, the coordination of care during the pandemic was excellent, uh, thanks to Dr. Janice Fitzgerald and her team and the Premier and the Minister. And uh, it was great that uh, they allowed the people that were, that had the expertise to, um, to make the decisions uh, for us. And we did, we fared quite well um, during the pandemic as well. Uh, we also were uh, able to give priority to vulnerable populations for vaccines, for example, um, support for housing and help with the accessibility of food. So, uh, so what can we learn from uh, the pandemic going forward? So some potential strategies or solutions for the future. Uh, so just kind of to keep in mind that it's not what one professional group can contribute. Uh, we as like MPs uh, can offer or contribute to be part of the solution. To so we can provide more coordinated care and access to the most appropriate provider and ensuring that we're patient centered meet to meet you where you are to bring you to a better place on your health journey. We need to shift from an illness or treatment focused model of care to a health focused one, an upstream approach. You know, look at risk factors, you know, identify them early uh, so we can prevent diseases. Obviously, we need to have care in place for people with diseases, with chronic conditions, 
and so on, but um, we need to invest in the health of our populations. What about some incentives or rewards for staying healthy? We have, there's different models of, you know, that uh, about that and around that uh, in different countries, we need to look beyond and broadly. So remember the strategies for improvement in our health system from the health accord that I just mentioned, the focus on social determinants of health, the care of underserved populations and children, of course, elderly. Um, we need to integrate health and social systems. And we need to have the government, community leaders, and committed healthcare providers with nurse practitioners and nurses included, and public representatives um, to help us enhance the, and promote the health of the population and improve our healthcare system in the future. And that's all I have to share at the moment. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. I have any questions for the audience? We do have some questions. We <laughs> okay. do have some questions, not surprising. Uh, but first, very, very briefly, uh, I want to say thank you to Dr. Bruno for taking uh, the time to share her expertise with us on such an important topic. Um, and I want to tell you that um, Manulife is a, 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 a partner with alumni engagement and um, they have um, Supplemental life, health, and dental insurance. Uh, this is a relatively recently added program for alumni and members of the memorial community, and it's something you might like to check out. Um, so now we are going to move to questions. Um, we do already have a few, and I see more in the chat popping in. So the first question that we have for you, Dr. Bruno, is um, that that slide about courses, uh, one person had uh, had asked if they couldn't read the slide completely and they were wondering, is there any specific courses that uh, nurse practitioners take that focus on the needs of older adults? That's an excellent question. And uh, we do have uh, our, all our courses are across the lifespan from pediatrics to adults and into the older adults. We don't have one specific uh, course at the moment focused on uh, geriatric care, but as you know, with the aging population, uh, we are um, in the process of revamping our, uh, our, our curriculum. Um, over the next <clears throat> year or so, because we have uh, revised entry level competencies. So that is one area, of course, we are going to be uh, focusing on in order to meet the needs of the population. So uh, you can, there probably will be uh, a course that is specific to uh, geriatric care or a part of a course, but we do teach uh, geriatric care in the program at the moment, but it's no, it's not. To answer your questions, is not a specific course um, in the current program. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Tracy is wondering about the main differences between nurse practitioners and family physicians in terms of what they can offer patients. Okay, so uh, both uh, nurse practitioners and family physicians are primary health care providers or primary care providers. Um, Nurse practitioners focus on common conditions, uh, as I, I mentioned, some of the examples in terms of um, chronic illnesses, mental health and addictions, and so on. Uh, in terms of the physicians and their scope of practice, it they're not this, exactly the same. Uh, obviously, um, you know, physicians, they go through medical school and um, they have a different, uh, they have a different, but they do. There are commonalities, I guess, is the best way to describe it uh, in terms of what the scope of their practice is. But uh, obviously, um, we are not physicians. We're nurse practitioners. We're nurses uh, with advanced um, skills and uh, competencies to manage many um, common conditions in the community and in the hospital setting. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. I hope. <laughs> Okay, um, and here's sort of a related question, I suppose. Um, uh, Linda's wondering 
what specific medical procedures can a nurse practitioner perform that a registered nurse can't? Okay, so uh, in the program, in the nurse practitioner program, we do have uh, specific skills that the uh, MPs learn. For example, suturing, uh, skin uh, punch biopsies. Um, they uh, also learn about um, uh, do, 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 uh, X-ray interpretation, and so there's uh, there's a number of skills that that uh, nurse practitioners, I guess, would be able to perform that a registered nurse uh, would not. Um, so, and then it depends, of course, on their area of practice. So, some a nurse practitioner may be uh, in the hospital setting and inserting a chest tube that uh, an RN wouldn't be normally be in their scope of practice. So it depends really, their their um, skills are really specific to the population that they serve. Okay. Um, Leslie is one wondering if private nurse practitioners have access to medical reports. So that's a good question. Um, hmm, that's a very good question. So, if they're in private practice, uh, actually, I don't think I can answer that question. Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. I should okay. I'll have to put that down to check it out. But okay. uh, I, 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 I really uh, can't answer that because um, normally, uh, you know, if they're working within a regional health authority, that they'd have access to Meditech and the health health record. Um, mm -hmm. So they have all MPs. Uh, I will say do have access to health ENL which is the provincial uh, health network. Um, and there are some, um, there is patient information on, on that system, that provincial system, um, but um, I'm not sure if they would have access to all um, records related to a patient, but they would have be able to visualize like diagnostic imaging, um, look at some blood work and things like that. So since we've had that, uh, healthy NL uh, provincial health record um, available. All MPs, all nurse practitioners would have access to that. Okay. Now we have a couple of questions about um, payment and insurance and things like that. If if we can ask you these, I'm going to ask them together. Um, one question is that it was just clarifying if you said that nurse practitioners cannot bill. Um, MSI in Newfoundland and Labrador and that patients pay out of pocket. And the second question is, are nurse practitioners covered through insurance? Okay, so, so nurse practitioners um, cannot bill MCP. Um, MCP. Why is yeah, MCP. That? So that if uh, they ha do provide a service, um, the people have to pay for that. Um, similar to like a physio or OT or whatever, there are the nursing services are insur uh, insurable, um, but the excess would have to be paid by patient by people if they would if they want to be cared for for by an MP uh, outside of a regional health authority, you know, such as the cl collaborative team clinic or whatever, um, mm -hmm. so in private practice um, only part of their services are able to be um, paid for and otherwise uh, people have to pay themselves. That's correct. Right. And that leads me to Colleen's question, which is why do we seem to be behind other places in giving nurse practitioners the ability to build directly to the government and to be a vital part of the healthcare system? That's the, that's a very good question. <laughs> Is that the elephant the in the room? <laughs> that's the question of the hour. So uh, yeah. we, we we hope that they do come up with a funding strategy so that, uh, you know, it's fair and it's comparable and it works for all providers. Uh, the fee for service is model is expensive and it's not always, um, you know, effective in terms of, um, you know, providing that time, you know, to deal with patients with multi multiple problems, multi morbidity, you know, it's based on, you know, the qu the quantity and, and, uh, you know, and their time limited in terms of the, uh, you know, the slots and everything. So it's not an ideal system. So 
hopefully they can, you know, the government, those smart people will come up with a better funding strategy so that, uh, you know, the patients can access the care that they need from nurse practitioners and physicians, as well as other providers, such as the other team members, pharmacists, you know, and so on, social oh workers, God. dietitians. Yeah. So that's what a lot of this work is is being done right now is trying to address that issue, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Great question. Um, now, here's a question from uh, someone who says, "I did my education in the United States, and am currently doing the RN reentry program. I would like to do the nurse practitioner program. Having done my education in the United States, will it be a problem when applying to the program?" Okay, I would suggest that person would contact us. <laughs> I can probably okay. address that because uh, there's there's many things I need to address there. So kind of need to okay. look at it on an individual basis. So if okay. if you would like to uh, contact Grad Nursing at Mon.ca, and, okay. uh, and then we can have a we we can have a meeting and discuss that for sure. Okay, I'll just pop that in the in the chat that email Grad Nursing at Mon.ca. I've also popped in the chat a link to the story uh, in the Gazette uh, that Marsha Porter uh, has written about you and nurse practitioners uh, for everyone to have a chance to read. Um, here is a, let me just check our, I don't think I have anything new here. Um, Michael is asking, in regards to the profit, I think this is, I mean, essentially it's a, the similar question, but the profit nurse practitioners, well, what, I mean, non fee for service, do you see this growing in Newfoundland and Labrador, or do you see nurse practitioners being more available through the regional health authorities? Hmm. Well, I'm not sure, like what the future holds really. Um, yeah. You know, it would be. You know, obviously, MPs are capable of being self-employed um, and being in private practice and offering excellent care to patients um, and their families. But um, we just like to see the, you know, the, uh, I guess nurse practitioners more fully integrated within mm -hmm. the healthcare system and uh, be part of the solution. You know. Yes. That's the ideal, isn't it? If that's the ideal. Yes, that's yeah. the ideal. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's interesting, you know, when you bring up the pandemic and in terms of it, um, what what your husband said uh, about it being, what did he say? It was a, it was a, a forced experiment. A forced experiment, yeah. Right, but I mean, in terms of what it, sh how it showed us how we can change and we can, you know, try new things. And sometimes we can do it really quickly if we have to. And so that I think is um, in this context, it's an interesting kind of comparative, isn't it? I don't know. Um, is there any other questions for Dr. Bruno that uh, anyone out there has? Because I don't think we have any more. I'm just having a look here. Don't be shy. Nope, I don't see any more. Um, Dr. Bruno, is there anything in particular that you want to uh, add or share or, you know, anything that you'd like to say to those watching? Well, I last word goes to you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I just would like to thank everybody for attending and it's great that people are interested in nurse practitioners and can see that we have, you know, provide a great service and, um, and uh, I really look forward to the future and uh, seeing nurse practitioners here, there, and everywhere. We're even more so than we already are. I, I, I think uh, it's, it's a great time uh, to be a nurse, registered nurse, and a nurse practitioner. And uh, we just need to work together to um, improve our health outcomes because we're not in good shape at the moment. And we. Uh, we're a team player and we want the best for our province. I guess Thank that's all so I have to say. <laughs> that's very well said. Very well said. Thank um, you. Now, we did have one final question. Leslie was wondering, is there anywhere to find a list of nurse practitioners here in the province? 
Oh, heavens. Okay. So like on the college of registered nurses of Newfoundland and Labrador website, mm -hmm. CRNNL.ca, um, there are a list of all the nurse practitioners in the province. You go to what's, the, what's, what's the address? What's the website address? Uh, it's uh, C R. Yeah. N N L. Mm -hmm. Dot C A. I see it. I just can pop it in the chat. Sure, and uh, the the member search um, so you can you can locate uh, the nurse practitioners across the, the province, um, and there's a list of where they work and everything. But they, they there is a full list of all the registered nurse practitioners in the province. Okay, I thought that fifty strong, <laughs> over two hundred and fifty strong. <laughs> Let's hope for more. Let's hope this time next year there's more. Oh, um, yes, it'll be great. Well, I, oh, wait, and hold on. Uh, here's something uh, Colleen Morrison is saying. Thank you so much for this presentation. Having received care from nurse practitioners, both in Newfoundland and Labrador and on my travels, I'm a huge proponent of their ability to be an integral part of our healthcare system. I also think the public is on side with this sentiment. Let's hope those in power finally see the light and make that a possibility. They have so much to offer as a highly educated Highly professional group of nursing professionals. Well, we couldn't say wow. that any better than ourselves. Wow. Thank you, Colleen, for that. <laughs> she can have and the Colleen last word. was Colleen was not uh, not paid for that endorsement. I have to <laughs> Thank say, you, Colleen. Um, but anyway, I, I would just like to say we have come to our, the end of our time together. But thank you so much to Dr. Bruno for sharing her time and her expertise on this incredibly important topic with us. Um, and thank you all uh, of you attendees for choosing to spend some time with us today and uh, and for your great questions. And they really were great questions. You stumped sure. Dr. Bruno a couple of times. <laughs> <You did. laughs> um, we will be sharing the presentation and a link to this recorded um, webinar. And uh, you can feel free to share those with your friends and family and, and connections and networks. Uh, if you enjoyed today's event, uh, we do have some other events coming up, including one on Monday, November 21st on demystifying university research, and that's going to be part of research week. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, this session, uh, as we indicated earlier, we have been recording this and you should all keep a look out in your inbox for a link. And that is it from us, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, Dr. Bruno, you enjoy your day. I think you're going to be you. busy. She's going to be on <laughs> on the go later today, too. So it never yeah. stops. No, thank you very much. Thanks again. Bye. Bye-bye.